Yeah, thank you everybody very much for staying and uh, being here for our panel discussion with our speakers. Um, my name is Andreas Ludwig. I'm a, a, post, a senior postdoc in Frank Schröder's lab. Um, some people say I'm, I'm a very senior postdoc <laughs> and this might be also the reason uh, why I'm uh, guiding through the conference instead of being a mentor. But um, So here are the rules uh, how we will do it. Um, so I think I ask the first round of questions to, to our guests um, and then everybody in the auditorium is free to, to ask any kind of question uh, to either uh, individual persons or like more general things they want to have answered about the mentorship program or about like career planning in general. And uh, I think we get started with uh, Julia. Uh, she's the only person who hasn't uh, in, uh, uh, introduced her. Um, so, who are you and why are you here? <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Julia Miller. I am the mentee of Erica. So, that's one of the reasons why I'm here. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student. I actually don't work in the building. I work across the street at the USDA Holly Center with Miguel Pinero. So, I'm in the plant biology section of SIPS. Um, and I'm here to answer more questions about what it's like to be a mentee in the program. Yeah, okay. So we heard from, from Kitty um, that she sort of had experiences during the mentorship uh, which were kind of specifically directed towards a career uh, in the industry. So can you uh, describe a little bit the nature of the mentor-mentee relation with Erica and what you might have learned or if you have had some uh, any interesting inputs for, for career planning? Yeah, so um, I was part of the program not this past year, but the year before, and that was when the program was a little bit more open. Um, we definitely had some materials and discussions about what it was supposed to be like, but that allowed um, Eric and I to have kind of more of a, a less structured relationship, so we really started, I think, just emailing and talking on the phone, um, just getting to know each other. At that point, I hadn't really talked to too many people who are in the tech transfer field, so that was really interesting to hear, like you know, what her day-to-day -day life is and her career and in her position and how she got there. Um, and then you know, we talked about like other types of career development things, like yeah, working on resume, which like Kitty mentioned, and she helped uh, Erica helped me apply to Cornell's internship at the CTL, the Center for Technology Licensing, which was really awesome. So I got that position, thanks um, to her help. <laughs> um, and the second question was about how to be... Um, do you have, did it sort of clarify your job perspective? Yeah, yeah, I definitely say um, it really helped clarify and kind of focus what I was interested in. It was nice to talk to someone who was in the field as well as just being another mentor who's interested in my progress and interested, you know, on my day-to-day -day life was really helpful as well. It's not even just career, but same thing with Kitty said, kind of like a friend to talk to or like a nice third party to like bounce ideas off of related to your career and your work, but also just to um, your life. Next question goes to your mentor, Erica. And um, so, first of all, how is your experience with men mentoring? Um, or do you have uh, experience of being mentored in the past that made you, hey, yeah, I'm sort of I'm interested in that. And how did it all work out from your perspective last year? Sorry. Okay, that was a lot of questions. So, um, <laughs> so <that's> structure. <laughs> I'm going to answer them out of order that you asked them. The first is, have I benefited from mentors, of course. Um, not only have I had people who pushed me into applying for jobs, like I talked about my uh, committee chair of my thesis, but I've also had mentors who helped me throughout the process. Um, patent law is one of the, the last, what I'll call apprenticeships. It's a very convoluted, uh, very complex, definitely not intuitive uh, practices. And so learning to string together sentences in a way that examiners are used to receiving definitely requires a mentor. I'm very lucky. I've worked with a PhD JD uh, patent attorney for the past five years now, um, who is a, as a friend and an advocate for me. Um, I get a Skype message from him pretty much every morning. He's in Indianapolis, so he thinks it's okay to Skype me at 6 a.m., which is 5 a.m. my time. So every morning, 
Um, he sends me a Skype message. This turned out to be really, really important when I was in Peru. I was uh, headed on a train, and if he had not Skyped me and I hadn't heard the ping, I probably would have missed my train, and I would not have gotten to see Machu Picchu. So, um, so it's I also beneficial for the mentor. <laughs> so, so having, having a mentor is definitely important. It's something that I want to give back. Um, I believe in community, and I believe in developing that, and so it was something that when an opportunity presented itself and I had the possibility of being a mentor, I wanted to do that. Um, that said, I don't know as if you need a formal process to be a mentor. Um, I'm really, I don't view it as me acting as a mentor so much as me acting as a colleague and acting as a friend and, and providing my network. Are we too formal? <laughs> so, no, I, 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 didn't, I didn't think that it was, was uh, too formal, um, but I, I think that, that um, it's, a, it's a very interesting question to ask, how do I, you know, how did I learn to be a mentor, or why did I want to be a mentor? I just, I wanted friends, and I wanted to community, and I wanted to share what it is that I have, so to the extent if that's formal or informal, I, I really believe in that, so. I don't know if that answered all of the, it seemed to be three questions. I think that answered I think it did. Yeah, next is with Jesse. Um, we consider you as our senior mentor. Because you have been in both years of our program. So I think first year I was with Prashant. Same here. Yep. And now uh, it's Robin, right? And um, so first of all I wanted to ask you uh, about like some general statement as our senior uh, mentor. We also have our super mentor here. Mm -hmm. uh, we will talk about that in a bit. Um, but after hearing your talk, I have a question about, are you the one who can maybe launch re research projects or and or hire people in your company? If there's an opening, yeah. <laughs> 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 um, launching a project in industry is, is different than it is when you're in academia. You know, you're used to writing very formal, very long grants. Getting a project started in industry, you maybe can do it with one PowerPoint slide. <laughs> if you do it right. Okay. And that means laying the groundwork um, with people that are influential, that, that hold the ultimate budgets and also people that are willing to think with you and to promote you know, your good ideas as well with you. And so it's a very different process than it is in academia. But it's are you kind of in a position where you could like, provide this PowerPoint slide? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it, it goes, um, it can be all layers of the company you can mm -hmm. do that. If you have an idea, you know, even as a technician working at the bench, mm -hmm. There are ways to get your ideas known, um, to get maybe your projects or side projects started. And what's really important in industry is knowing your company well and knowing what your company's goals are, mm -hmm. knowing what the focus is, and aligning what you want to do, being able to align it to those goals. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll never get something started that is you know, way out in left field and doesn't relate to, to really what your company's working on doesn't mean you can't get really out there ideas started. Mm -hmm. They just, you have to be able to show how it can have an, an impact along uh, what the company is, is working on. Very interesting. Maybe I sent you someone over during the lunch break. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, Tom, sorry, you wanted to comment on that? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tom. Um, oh boy. So I, I wrote down a couple of things, so a uh, fact of the matter is I might know you better than you might think, because I was one of your Facebook friends until you decided not to do that anymore. We, we uh, learned about the reasons, and, uh, bitter comments, and, um, so, and I mean, just to make a long story short, so what I really learned that from this Facebook post that uh, would be also learned from this talk, that he's like, he might have done things writer than other people and uh, so I wanted to like uh, ask how that happened but but you basically answered all of that yeah. so um, since I know that you are kind of 
I call it what, like the super mentor for basically undergrads in the chemistry program. Um, for example, my uh, uh, lab mate um, Oishika Panda. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I do. Um, so she was sort of like um, guided through her TA program. And also, when you told us about this really success story that you get underprivileged kids, uh, like uh, increasing their, their grades and stuff. So, so how do you do that? And so what's kind of your your approach for, for like mentoring younger fellows? Is that maybe this is a complex question? But <laughs> I don't know. Well, it is a complex mm -hmm. question, but um, I, I think it's it's natural on some level, right? I think you treat and react to people how you want it to be treated or reacted to in your own search for going forward. Something that I think I'm effective in in my job, because I do mentor a lot of undergraduates and graduate students, which I had never done before I came to Cornell graduate students. So that was all new to me and actually is a wonderful part of my job, because they're closer to the end, quote unquote, uh, you know, maybe getting a job, you know, that's real than most of my undergraduates, who most of them are considering graduate or professional schools. Um, but what I try to do is act as a reasonable ear for what they want to tell people, right? And you have to open yourself up as a mentor, and honestly, as a mentee, I think. I am most effective as a mentor when my mentees tell me everything about themselves. And there's some of my colleagues that find that very discomforting because kids will tell you lots of things and you have to be prepared to hear things that maybe you didn't expect from that person because they want to open up their personal life to you. And it, I think it's important to know your personal life in order to give you advice because for some people that's going to guide where they're going to want to live in the United States because it's guided by who they are as a person and they're going to feel more welcome in certain areas of this country and less welcome in other areas. There's other, going to be other kids that aren't going to care about that. And there's, uh, it's really important to understand, I think, your, your mentee as a person, but for the mentee to tell their mentor, this is kind of what I'm really interested in. And I, sometimes I think uh, I act as an ear in place of their parents. Um, I'm not judgmental. Right? What was said about one of my colleagues recently at his funeral on Wednesday, uh, Jerry Meinwald, who many of you know, I'm sure, right, passed away in the early morning hours of Tuesday. And I knew Jerry well, um, and it was a sad passing. But what his wife, uh, Charlotte, said of 37 years at the funeral, she said, Jerry had great judgment, but he was never judgmental. And I like to think that's true of me. I don't know. I don't know if anybody will st stand up and say that at my funeral someday. But I would like them to do that. And that's, I think, important in a mentor-mentee relationship, is that you don't judge them by what you think they should be doing. It's not important what you think they should be doing. It's important what they think they should be doing. And you try and point them in that direction and let them know that that's okay. My story, I think, kind of resonates with them on some level because I told a couple people during break, there's kids that come up to me and say, how did you know in college you would be teaching at Cornell? I had no idea, right? I would have thought you were on LSD if you came up to me in college and said, I'd be in a faculty position at Cornell. It's like, are you crazy? You know, that good institution is going to want this piece of crap? Right? Uh, instructing its kids. The kids are smarter than I am. The only advantage I have is 25 years of looking at stuff. And so I think just helping people. And, but if you want a mentor, look for somebody who you can connect with personally would be my advice. I tell the same thing on letters of recommendation. Um, students ask people for letters of recommendation who they did academically well in their classes, right? I teach classes of sometimes 600, 800 students. And I give out some A's of some students that I've actually never met. And they come up and ask me, can I get a letter of recommendation? And I always decline them. 
because I say to them, I don't know you, and so I can't say anything more than your transcript says. So it really is worth your effort to reach out to people. In my job, because there's so many people, you have to puncture into my world. Right? I'm not going to come and find you, and I think that's probably true of most faculty here at Cornell. And there'll be some that'll be put off if you want to have conversations with them, but many of them will want to sit down and have a conversation with you, and then you'll find those people that will lead you in the right direction. And so find people that are willing to do that with you, and, and tell them about yourself and what you really want to do, because they should be able to help you get there. Thank you. Really? Who am I passing this to? To Kitty. Um, oh, Kitty. No, it's so, your turn. <laughs> Kitty, I have a uh -oh. quick question. Are you doing okay? Do, do you like what you see here? What you kind of created? Sorry, but uh, look, no, you, you were mentioning that you already gave, gave a lot of statements in the introduction to this. But um, so this is why we now want to um, hear if we get um, questions from the audience. Uh, I see uh, people involved in the mentor program everywhere. Can you please raise, raise your hands? Here, there, yeah, uh huh. We have quite a lot. Uh, are there other people who would be in general interested in kind of a program like that? No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and now, okay, so is, um, any questions to, to, our, to our panel? David, uh, welcome. <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 it's, a, it's sort of a disgusting to forget it, but uh, one thing that comes up in, in a, a lot of the discussions I've been involved in around the country on mentoring um, is accountability. Um, so what are the responsibilities and what's the accountability of mentors? Like, for example, the BTM network, you could imagine something like Yelp, right? And there's reviews or <laughs> uh, it's, it's a serious issue because, um, you know, you might think of, uh, you know, what was the wrong mentor and I gave this service and then it, that should be known somehow. Or if somebody really does, you know, do what Tom does and it's wonderful, uh, that should be communicated somehow in a, in a formalized way. I believe over the years, uh, the most effective mentors for BTI, PGS, uh, could be identified and, um, you know, we can make special efforts to retain them. And on the other hand, Things aren't working that well. Um, perhaps you know that person should um, not be you know, punished. Should <laughs> 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 be punished. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so, Kitty, do you want to answer this? Because we, we made a survey, and which is pretty precise, right? Yes. Uh huh. And um, so, the outcome. Do you want to go on about this? Lena would be the, the, the perfect person. She, she's traveling right now. Jesse is interested. Yeah. Jesse's interested. <laughs> yes. Yes, he's really. So, we, first of all, so we do have um, pretty good data about our last year uh, program, what we consider as successful and not. It's almost, it's almost threatening how, how precise it is. Um, and we <laughs> try to learn, right, Keith? And this is also what she mentioned in her introduction that. We go from uh, H and M branding to, <laughs> to, to I don't know Hermes. Hermes. <laughs> okay, Jesse, you know. I I think those surveys and the things that you did uh, are great, and it's for doing exactly what you said, learning. Um, Erica said it before that we haven't taken a class, we haven't gotten a degree <laughs> in mentoring. We don't necessarily know exactly how to do it. We're also learning in this process. And I think something I recommended on the surveys and the questionnaires last year was that it'd be good for the mentors to be able to talk to each other at some point and to learn from each other. Because it may be, David, like you're saying, that you know maybe some aren't as good. It may be that they're, they're still at an early point of learning how to do it. Yes, but um, I don't mean to interrupt, but what I'm saying is need to be some metrics that, you know, it's, it's great to survey people, but if you don't know how to evaluate the answer to the right questions, you'll just get a feeling that, yes, we reached out to and asked people about their experience, but what do you do with the results? And what are, in fact, 
you know, the responsibilities. What is a metric of success? What does successful mentoring even look like uh, in the long term? If we think about this as a longitudinal thing that will go on for the next 20 years, uh, what would we like to see in 10 years, 5 years? I mean, has the PGS had an opportunity to think about long-term objectives instead of short-term implementation? And I think that that process has started, but I think one of the, the feedback that the community got from mentors was that they would like to see it be a little bit more structured. So they like to see at the outset what are the expectations. And when you have the expectations, then it becomes easier to actually put some metrics on whether they were met. Um, but that's going to be different for each mentee mentor. And that's where it becomes a little bit tricky because there are, there are different expectations. There may be uh, some mentees that really what they need out of that mentor relationship is somebody to talk to, somebody to bounce their ideas about their career, their uncertainties off of them. How do you put a number on that? You can't. But there may be other mentees that really, they want help in crafting their resume, in making connections, and in finding the position that they know they want. Well, you I can probably put better you, metrics on that. You could put a number on the first one, and you could say, was the person available, with the response to the future yeah. respect? I mean, these yeah. are, I, if I was looking for a mentor, those are the kind of things that I would be interested in. Right? And, and those are the things that I think uh, this, this thought of making it more structured can definitely hit on those. Like, this is the expectation. You yeah, know, that you will talk a certain amount. So, Eric, you want to say something? Well, it, it, it's related to the question that David and, and Jesse are addressing. Um, maybe not thinking about in terms of reviews, but I've certainly read about mentorship programs that have contracts involved, right? So, mm -hmm. so you know, rather than just kind of a formal questionnaire, that there's actually a set of expectations that are laid out, and and that is signed on both sides, you know, the mentor side and and I'm, I'm curious if, you know, how the mentors think about that and how the, the mentees think about that. Would that be a disincentive or an incentive? So, what do you guys think? I probably couldn't sign that contract without going through a bunch of legal stuff. So, <laughs> short of a signature, I yeah. think that's, it's a good idea because you're setting the expectations for how, what this relationship is going to be uh, and how it's, uh, how it should be conducted, or at least some boundaries there. And I think for me as a mentor, I would appreciate that because I know the expectations uh, in this program. So. I'll come at it from the other side. Um, I, I wouldn't do that if you paid me. Okay? To me, being a mentor is generally informal. The Yelp reviews are that nobody seeks you out anymore. Okay? At least at a community like Cornell, um, kids talk to other kids, right? And I mean kids as like graduate student kids, faculty student kids, undergraduate kids, right? Those communities tend to talk. I know, I know in my department, myself, whose undergraduates value as mentors because they've told me in conversations, don't go to this person, right? Go to this person for this. And so I think they've kind of taken care of that. It isn't in any form you can access unless you talk to people, but I actually think that's good because I think the society is degenerating into a society where we don't talk to people anymore. Right? We talk to our phones and we don't talk to people anymore. And I really think the art of communication and being able to have a conversation with people uh, is something that you need to have in life. So I do think you, it should be informal, and if it's not working out, the, the, your mentee should just be able to leave, right? Or you should be able to tell your mentee, I don't think I'm the right person for you. And I think you should seek somebody else because we don't seem to be connected. And I actually have told kids that in the past. I said, we don't seem to be working, you don't seem to be gaining value from us meeting here. Does that happen a lot? Not it much. It really doesn't happen much, okay. right? Um, in, at least in my experience, because I came from a family of nine. I, I can talk to anybody. Um, you know, I'll talk to this wall address if you let me, right? This <laughs> afternoon, right? I'll, I'll be the mentor for the wall. Um, so, so don't, yeah. don't, don't so I think that literally making that personal connection is important, and you find that person, right? So, and, so. and don't 
look for them, they kind of find you, right? They appear to you at a meeting or at a seminar. That's why it's important to be involved in your department and avoid what Kitty said, right, and in her introduction of just sitting in the lab all the time. Right? I mean, we are kind of building these uh, pairs. Yeah. So it's basically this year it was two of us who make those decisions. Yeah. Is that something that you really don't like? No, I don't mind really it. Organic. I like all levels, but I mean, I appreciate organic, but I don't mind it if it's more structured. I would mind a contract, mm -hmm. right? Because a contract says to me that I have to do X at this time, and in my job, I can't guarantee that I can do X at that time, right? Because mm -hmm. I may literally have the proverbial manure hitting my fan, mm -hmm. right, at that pre precise moment. So first of all, I want to ask you to, what do you think about the contract concept? As There's a microphone, Kitty. You're going to need it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think it's very necessary. Uh, it's. I feel for each pair, the situation is very different, and uh, if you, you just need to try your best to make this mentorship work. And I think if you have the attitude and if you want to do it, it will work out. You don't need something to limit yourself and then try to. So all you do is follow in a contract and step by step. I mean, I do give a guidance, but uh, it's just a uh, suggested to do this. You don't have to follow it. I, I said it in the guidance very clearly. Feel free to edit it according to your situation. So I think it's more important the better the mentor, uh, the, especially the mentee, really want to get help and know at least to know the direction he wants to go. And then maybe it's not very clear at this time, but that's also very important that you figure out which direction you want to go with this mentor. So I, I don't think we need a contract, but you do need the attitude that you want to work this out. Julia? Um, I might be splitting hairs here, but I can see depending on how much experience the mentor and the mentee has, it might be worth to have more of a formalized um, re relationship. Um, I help set up a program with graduate students as men mentors and as undergraduates as mentees, and I kind of pushed having a more formal relationship as I was setting up that program, just because this might have been when it, uh, uh, not the first time, but this might have been uh, one of the first times that the graduate students had um, mentees. And um, yeah, so we set up the program to have a little bit more oversight, but I'm sure as you get farther along in your career, you know, you would have more um, experience being a mentor as well as being a mentee, so you might need less formalized document. We had something from Alexa earlier and Bob. Sure. Um, a comment and a segue into the question I've been wanting to see, but the comment still on this topic is I felt that Kitty actually did a pretty nice job of laying out some you might ground rules that could almost be constitute as a contract like agreement between the mentees and mentors this year. And um, I think David missed it in her opening slides. And I don't know how much other people get to see this, but those instructions, there's a full page. Do we have that on the web page now? Not yet. But we will, right? Yes. <laughs> Um, but basically, well, actually, I don't know. I didn't know you wanted that specifically, but that's a great idea. We should talk more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate all of those guidelines, and there were things like, you know, the first half, or and this is what you showed, work on getting to know your mentor, developing a relationship. It's like a checklist of these things that you do, but then it seems like the deliverables were really in the second half of the year. Work on your resume, apply for jobs, make a decision where you want to go. And to be honest, and this is a segue into my question, for me, in my unique situation, which is I almost quit my PhD and took two years off, and now I'm trying to finish and get back into research, it's not as much about figuring out what I want to do, because I'm pretty open and, and I have some ideas at the same time. It's more about understanding what it means to be a researcher and all the different paths that get us to our final place. And I think something that didn't really come up in these guidelines was addressing self-efficacy and understanding what it takes to be all the different types of scientists. Not just which career is right for you, but you know, how do you feel about yourself as a scientist? How can you learn to see your like what value you have 
you know, my strengths, what are my strengths? Not just for deciding, you know, what would I like to do, but what could I succeed at? And I feel like that's a lot harder to sort of lay out. So my question for the panel is, do you have examples of a period in your life where you felt that you didn't fit the job, like you weren't good enough for what you wanted to do, and how did you handle that? Did you convince yourself you were good enough, or did you find something else you felt you were better fit for? Like the self-efficacy question is, how did you pass a problem with self <laughs> I've not had many jobs, so. I'll take it. I, I probably can't help you, so I'll pass the mic to my right eventually. Um, I decided I wanted to teach in graduate school. Um, not my first year at Chicago. So you were required to teach three quarters at Chicago. And then you weren't required to teach. And in those days, funding was generally stable. So you didn't have to. Um, I taught in my third year, and in that third year, I actually felt like I was good at it for the first time in my life. And I thought I tried really hard in my first year, but I was, I was a, I had brought a knife to a gunfight, is the way that I constantly felt, right? That I wasn't very effective because I didn't know what I was doing on some level. And in my third year, I felt like I knew what I was doing. And at that point, I knew I wanted to teach. And at no point after that did I feel like I couldn't be effective. I was terrified at many points in my career, right? Including in Paris this winter, when I was asked to fill in an extra class on top of my normal load because a colleague's wife has cancer. And so I took on 614 extra students on top of my 500 normal students. And I actually woke up in, in bed one morning in Paris with my legs shaking. Like, could I do this? It was the first time that I had felt that in years, and I thought, of course I can. I've handled worse in the past than this. Right? But that idea, I think you find, to me it was finding something that you like to do, and then moving towards that. Believing that you can be good at it, and get better at it. Because right? I'm not the best teacher in the world. But every year I try to get better. So I'm going to go back to the question since I didn't discuss it when we were talking about the contract. I think really this all comes back, and maybe this is why I'm sitting in between these two and why I'm mentoring <laughs> at Julia, is that it has to be based in a friendship and in a reason to want to advocate and be supportive of that individual. Um, as far, I think imposter syndrome, that's what I'm going to call it, imposter syndrome exists all the time. Uh, I, you know, on yesterday morning as I was flying, I was sending text messages to the people who I consider my mentors because I was going through my own, why am I doing this? What role do I have? I don't believe it. And so I think the way you get past imposter syndrome is one, just doing it, right? The whole adage, fake it till you make it. Um, I hate that, but it's true. I mean, just keep getting up, keep doing it, eventually you get to the end. And the best part is that once you've done it a couple of times, and you faked it and it turned out that you made it, you now, the next time it comes up, because there's always a next time, the next time it comes up, you, oh, hey, you know, I did it once before, I can do it again. Um, and then the other thing is, find people who, who are your advocates. Ask people, what are my strengths? And if they say, no, you're a worthless human being, find someone else. <laughs> uh, because there are people who truly want you to succeed. And so find those people, seek them out as your mentors, and, and develop a friendship with them. Um, and I, I think that's, you're not going to get that through a contract. Um, you certainly would provide guidance for it, so I think that that would be beneficial. But I don't think that the mere signing of something is going to give that commitment of friendship and of advocacy and, and genuinely caring. Um, so, yeah. Jesse? Um, just on, you said imposter syndrome, and that's <laughs> what I was going to, the term I was going to use as well. I've never been in a job where I didn't feel like that at some point, ever. <laughs> Excuse me, what is imposter syndrome? It's when you feel like you're, you're not good enough or you don't know enough. 
Interesting, yeah? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
they realized that nobody was filling that role in the department, and I was willing to. And that's helpful if you have an employer that's willing. I, I come in and I, I teach two classes. I teach double what a normal research faculty member teaches at Cornell, and they consider that hard. I should say that I was teaching four at the previous college that I moved from per semester. So two was a 50% reduction in my load. Well, they thought it was a 100% increase. For me, it was a 50%. And most of my day I spent with my door open that I think Kitty will testify to because she passes by my office a lot to run out of Mars, I think, right, is where she's headed. And there's always kids in my office. It is my job. And nobody else is willing to do it, nor can they do it. Right? You can't ask Coates to spend six hours a day talking to undergraduates because he can't run a research group if he's doing it. Right? So I think understanding that you have the time, having an employer that allows you that privilege is also important. It's a really important role, and not just in academia. In a way, you, you created this position, is that correct? Yeah, I created, I mean, they offered me a job, they gave me a job, and then I just, I just, they gave me the power to do anything I wanted, mm -hmm. and they let me do it. And so I started doing the things that I gravitated towards, and I gravitate towards wanting to help and listen to people, because I had important people that did that for me in my life. Right, I had an organic chemistry professor who changed my life. And then what I didn't tell you in my introduction is I had a PCHEM professor as an undergrad who I absolutely butchered his class. Right? It was bloody and dead on the floor, and I was there next to it dead. <laughs> and I literally, I got a C in his class. Right? It's my worst grade as an undergraduate. But I worked so hard, I was outgunned in that course by the man. And he took, we invited him after the first exam to the bar with us. And he went. And in those conversations, he started talking about his life and how he had come to that institution. And I came to know him as a person for really the first time at my large undergraduate institution. And in, that, in those discussions, I came to value his counsel. And I eventually asked him for a letter of recommendation for graduate school. I got a C in his class. And he agreed to write that letter for me. And it obviously was a good one because I got into every graduate school that I applied to. Right? I've tried to pay that forward for kids that worked hard for me but didn't get to where they wanted to grade-wise, but I know them personally well and you have to invest in them, right? And for me, that means a lot of letters of recommendation, right? And setting them on some course. So the personal, I think, is so important. It was to me, right? To put me where I am. How can I not pay that back? One question. There in the back. Hey, uh, sure. Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, I think maybe I'll initially direct a specific question maybe towards Eric and Jesse, but then I'll, I'll try to make it more general as well. Um, so it relates to uh, something you were alluding to in terms of uh, finding meaning in your work kind of beyond personal financial incentives, I guess, and uh, sort of working in place that embodies your, your values. Um, I guess in in your work, is there sort of a model for uh, making sure that discoveries or the work you've done uh, can be translated, I guess, in the context of industry into uh, less lucrative global markets, I guess? Um, so, uh, I guess, technology transfer, uh, something that would be more done by a nonprofit, I suppose, but. Um, in the industry context or in the context of what began for um, yeah, technology transfer that yeah, it isn't going so that's to a, pay that much. That's a, a relatively easy question for me. Um, since the Danforth Center is a nonprofit and we do have an international institute for crop improvement, and we are engaged in 
research that is more humanitarian in nature. Uh, when we do licensing deals, we carve out um, exceptions for that. And then I'll let Jesse actually answer from the corporate perspective, but at least from the nonprofit perspective, when I'm negotiating those deals, I've never had a corporate partner say no. Because they also see it, I mean, maybe they see it as a PR opportunity. But sometimes, I mean, and honestly, I sincerely believe that even though they are on the corporate side and we view them as, you know, trying to, to cash in on every value, in, in reality, those people are our colleagues. They're the people who we shared a bench with when we were in grad school or in our postdoc. They're people who were trained by our mentors. They care about the world and the furthering of the world just as much as the people who are in the nonprofit sector. So I've never had a negotiation go south because I've asked for something that's more humanitarian in nature. And this is something that I've kind of wrestled with a bit uh, because that, uh, that contributing to society in general has been part of Dow Agri Science's mission. It's part of Corteva uh, Agri Science's mission. It's felt very intimately by the people that work there. There's a strong desire. They're in agriculture because they want to improve agriculture and they want to improve it around the world. That comes into conflict with being a publicly traded company that has to make quarterly profit um, to appease the shareholders. And so it, it can be difficult sometimes, but there is definitely that desire to do so and it comes through in every opportunity there is. Uh, within Dow Agri Sciences, we had uh, a group called the Hunger Solutions Network and it was really focused on uh, mainly Sub-Saharan Africa and what that group could do uh, regarding hunger there, how they could uh, make a contribution that way. What I'm really encouraged with in the new company that we have and the opportunities that we have is that it's much more intentionally there in the company, that that is a component of the mission. And there are things that are happening, there's a real uh, a real drive towards what's called open innovation. So we have a lot of technology, a lot of things that are developed within the company that usually don't make it out. And they could really benefit uh, other people around the world that are doing agricultural research. Now there's an effort to get those external, get those out of the company into, into hands of people that are working in those other geographies, working in those spaces, uh, where they can use those those technologies. And so I'm really encouraged by that, and I'm encouraged by the culture that's being set up uh, that's, that's really trying to be more intentional on everything that we want to do, but then actually putting more action behind that uh, to do it. Marks? Uh, yeah, so my question is uh, a little more specific to Jesse's uh, career. <laughs> so I, I saw that your first position in the industry was something like bioinformatics, and what you're doing now is like essentially data science and you know leading a team. So I was wondering how important was it to have skills in that area, like quantitative um, sciences or like math or computer science? Did you know a lot of programming languages uh, to, to land that first job? And uh, how did you? Uh, develop the leadership skills that you needed to, you know, uh, move on. That is not my core expertise. <laughs> Which sounds funny. I had a position, like you said, where the title of it was trade bioinformatician. <laughs> um, I did know some things, um, but I didn't know a bunch of computer languages and was, you know, an expert in computer science. Um, what I had is I had enough knowledge to connect the applied nature with, you know, data science and some skills there. And that, that was really important in that role, uh, because that's what my role was, was understanding the biology and connecting it to the tools that we could use data science-wise. Um, with that said, that's an area where if you want an easier time to find a job, develop those skills, uh, because they're really in demand. Um, but if you only develop those skills, there are only certain jobs that are available. And I really think the, 
the opportunities, and for me, the interesting part is the connection of, of different worlds, you know, of having computational skills connected with uh, some other aspect of, of biology or, or another field. Uh, in, in evolving in my career, and evolving, evolving uh, leadership responsibilities, I've been very fortunate and that I've gotten opportunities, uh, both when I was at Kijing before and then especially at Dow uh, AgriSciences. Uh, Dow has a culture that was described as a leadership factory. Okay, and that comes out of uh, some consultant work and evaluation of the company, evaluation of other companies. Uh, but what that meant is that they put a lot of emphasis on that. And so you have a development plan when you work there, that you have to have, that you have to come up with. And that's, it's really nobody is giving that to you. You're coming up with it and you're figuring out how you want to develop in your career. And for me, part of that was leadership and developing my leadership skills and I've been able to take advantage of opportunities to do that um, through the years that I've been at that. And so it's, it's just a learning process, a growing process. Uh, through your career, but you really need to identify what are the things that you want to do and how can you enlist others to help you do it and take advantage of, of the opportunities that exist. I have a question and understanding what you're actually for. Um, so after grad school, and this is related to negotiation um, for the salary when you be working. So, if you are facing a position where you actually have to determine what should be package, is what are like the indices you look out for to decide that this is what you actually want? Um, I ask this because before going to grad school, I worked for three years in a place where I was paid like three steps lower than what I should have been paid, and so like I want to learn from that lesson so I don't make then I also want to ask about the global perspective. So um, I appreciate that most of our panelists have like some elements that would show them to have like to have a, a voice globally if I can use that term. But if your focus is mostly on a global perspective, like you're not trying to be in one corner and then spread out, but you want to like really start out being global. How do you navigate that situation? I'll give a small background to this. I was talking with a, my colleague in the office, and I find myself being uh, in an interface where I'm getting certain skills. Certain skills that if I need to work in a certain place, is only certain kind of people that have that skill. And there is a divide between the ways some people are. And it's, it's difficult for me to have to that's a great question, very clearly. But it's just like, how do I say that I can do what any other person is doing, and I expect to be paid the way any other person is paid? Um, yeah, I. I'll start very briefly. My sister is a freelance photographer, and she once said, a quote that she heard somewhere else, which was, if you, if you charge nothing for it, people will think it has no value. And part of negotiation is that. There are a lot of tools to figure out, you know, with your skill set and your position, what is the value? What, what should you be paid? Um, but then you need to stick to that and you need to, to negotiate to that if it's important. Um, so it's really knowing what your skills are worth, knowing the context that it's going into, and then knowing uh, what's important to you. How do you know what your skills are worth? What skills you have, and what or what they're worth? Yeah. I can go on a website called Glassdoor right now. I can put in my number of years of experience, my, my title, other things. And it'll give me a bell curve of the salaries for that. And you know what? It's dead on. <laughs> dead on. That only works if you have a job that's somewhat common and enough people have gone in there and put in information.
information. If you have something really esoteric, you might have to kind of figure out something adjacent that's like it. Um, there are all sorts of tools like that that can help you just get some understanding. And some understanding, too, about whether you're located in the United States, maybe even whether you're located globally. So maybe not directly related to that, as to how to value. One of the things my mom told me as I was trying to decide what it is I wanted to do was that there are two ways to get paid. Either do something that no one wants to do or do something that no one can do. And so kind of related to what Jesse was talking about, some of the best jobs exist at the interface where you're doing translation. Um, whether that's translating biology and bioinformatics, or in my case, patent law and science. So for me, I found a niche um, as far as how you get paid doing it. Generally, the things that you like doing are the things that keep coming to you and that you continue to want to do, and that sort of puts you on a trajectory towards continuing to do that. So um, if you're really, if your aspiration is money and you're trying to figure out what you want to do, two ways of getting paid. Do something other people don't want to do, or do something that others can't, that they, either they don't want to get the degree, they don't want to get the experience, um, whatever that is. Um, I think Jesse gave good advice that also works in academia. You can, you can look up what schools pay, generally. Uh, that's readily accessible information. Um, I will tell you, though, personally, I was a horrible negotiator. In the, at the start of my career. I under accepted for my value, I think, um, because I was just glad somebody offered me a job. I was actually surprised. Oh, you want to hire me? I'll work for whatever you want to pay me. Right? Um, and I think what changed my situation was something I alluded to in my introduction, which was the willingness to leave. Uh, the real willingness to leave, not just bluffing and using it as a game against your employer, right? Because there are people who do that. But the real willingness to say, I could be happy somewhere else, and I have value. So maybe I'll go out and look and see what that value is. And then maybe you'll find something that you like. I never took a job for money, but each job that I took, I got more money than the one before. Right? And when I was hired at Cornell, I gave them a salary figure, and I said, without this figure, I will not work there. And it was far above what Cornell paid senior lecturers normally. And so it required about two weeks of people arguing and signing off on things before they were willing to do it. But I also had an associate chair that was willing to go to bat and say, he's not going to take it. Right? And I think that willingness to say, yes, I'm worth that, and then don't take the job if they won't come to that. But that may be something you have to do. And it's not easy at that point, because somebody's got to blink in a negotiation. And that's the hard part, is who blinks. Um, I wanted to um, make an, um, raise another topic. Um, it is related to um, what we as sort of like scientists are mostly interested in. What are like these hot topics um, that we want to sort of get solutions for? And uh, maybe you can like shoot me some suggestions. Otherwise, I would tell you something that I'm personally very much interested in. Is there like things that you really want to know about, like being underpaid or having the feeling to be exploited or I don't know what um, it's important for us as a committee that we sort of for future symposium that we like know about what people are interested in is there everybody's super happy mm -hmm. good <laughs> <laughs> no Russ has there ever been a point where you just thought I'm just gonna walk away from this I I'm done with this and then what have you done? Have you decided to deal with that? Or have you refocused and said, no, I started this and I have to finish? Okay, we just have that as one example. And um, so this is uh, because everybody's like thinking about the exit strategy. Is that what, what it is? Kind of. Yeah. Kind of. Uh, maybe something else? 
Um, yeah, so I thought a few people mentioned the importance of identifying um, our strengths, you know, perhaps even outside of a specific career. And I guess I was wanting to know, kind of, in your respective fields, what strengths, what traits are valued, and how do you see those being valued differently in the various fields that you've been a part of? And then I guess, related to that, are there things that you kind of wished you would have developed a little bit more while you were earlier in your careers? Uh, and so my major point is, um, who is a U.S. citizen here in the audience? Okay, it's about one third, maybe. And um, so, so another topic that we are both interested in as non-U.S. citizens is we kind of feel that it's, let's say, a little bit harder to get jobs, internships. Uh, it's mostly about like finding the, the job. Uh, so you. As, as you were mentioning, like the, the, the lower privileged, underpaid jobs, easy, but, but as, as long as you want to sort of, so you feel you have a certain value and want to be, get the appropriate sort of return, we run into problems and we definitely will have in the near future um, something more specific like a symposium about how to address these things. So we, we so I was just Thanks for, for, this, for the responses, and um, maybe like for, for, for the last round before we have final remarks, maybe you can pick from these topics and maybe you want to comment on this, um, because considering that these are problems from the base, base yeah. is that correct? Okay, thanks. <laughs> I'll, I'll comment on both areas. Uh, Russ, I'm not sure if Russ means getting out of my career or getting out of my job. Um, I've never felt like getting out of my career, but I have felt like getting out of my job. And when I felt that, I left, right? Because otherwise you're toxic, right? In the organization, right? And you work with people, you will work with people like this in your life, right? Where you look at them and you say, you should have left this place, right? Because you are actually toxic to the organization. You don't believe in it. You don't aspire to its values, right? And so you need to go. And there's a place for you. I'm not saying you're toxic as a person. You're toxic in that environment. And then the comment of what do you need is actually, I think, one of the greatest things. Um, because my students don't understand this. Right? Um, most of my students are scientists. And what scientists, in my opinion, do not realize every day that they need in any job, whether it's corporate or to just go over to me, you need the ability to communicate effectively, written and oral. It's a daily part of your job. If you're not good at it, you will not succeed and be promoted in your job. If you get good at it, and everybody can because I'm a natural introvert. I'm as introverted and geeky as they come. I was the kid that didn't do anything in high school because I was so socially inept. And now I have a job where I have to get up and speak to anonymous people in front of me. I can do it. You can develop those skills. What I wish I had developed earlier is writing skills. That I have only come to in the last 10 years, honestly, where I'm a good writer. I've always been a good editor, but not always a good writer myself. And I still struggle with that. And I think the way to do it is to throw yourself into writing environments. I force my advisees into writing classes. They all they want to take a science, right? We require 60 credit hours in chemistry at Cornell. I have a major this year who's graduating with 90 credits in chemistry. Right? 90 of her 130 are in chemistry. She never wants to leave the building. Right? So force yourself into those new situations. Right? Force yourself into meeting people who can give you those skills and work with you. <laughs> so I guess there were three topics that we can address. One, I'm, I'm a U.S. citizen, and obviously that's not something I can speak to, but I think you probably can drip off. I'm do, do, probably do, 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 You can drop off the, the, it is maybe a little bit. It is definitely harder, um, um, and it's something that I've been privileged and I can say that I have been privileged and I think that it is up to people like me who have been privileged to begin to advocate for for others who have not. So I will speak to that in that regard. Um, as far as exit strategies, I 
had promised myself I was extremely depressed in high school, partly because I was an introvert in high school as well, um, that I would never, I would never get out of bed if I couldn't find a reason to get out of bed. And I, there are some days that I have not gotten out of bed because there was nothing to get out of bed, but they are few and far between. So if I reach a point where I don't want to go to work, I don't. And it's up to me to make certain that I don't become that toxic person. Um, and when I find myself progressing to that, I make changes. Um, I'm on the opposite side as far as skill set. I love writing. I love writing. I, in fact, actually, people will send responses to emails and they're like, this is so beautifully written. And my response is, I get paid to write. Um, I love technical writing. The, the articles that I wrote for my PhD, the reviews that came back, this is beautifully written. So my strength is in writing. Um, the strength that I'm, or the weakness, I guess I'll call it a strength, the strength that I'm working on developing is in leadership. I'm not a particularly good leader. I'm more of a mentor. Um, I'm more of a tutor. I, I tend to walk the path side by side with someone as opposed to taking a position where it's leading. And so that's certainly something, as I'm thinking of my own development plan, that's something that I'm looking for people to help me move from being, you know, a partner on a trail walking down to being someone who can lead a group. Um, I'm a department of one, so it's pretty easy to walk that path parallelly, but I also hope that eventually my department will grow. I'll try to hit all three quickly, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I definitely agree that the immigration status, if you want to stay in the States, it, it's more difficult uh, if you're not a citizen or don't already have a green card. Um, there are opportunities, but you may have a different set of opportunities than a U.S. resident would have. Um, so you have to explore that and find those. Um, with that said, in larger companies, there can be more opportunities. I would say that I work with more non-residents than I work with residents on a daily basis. And so they're a large part of our company, uh, or non-citizens, I should say not. They are residents, but not citizens. Um, so it, it may be a different set of opportunities to look in, but they're, they're definitely there. Uh, as far as knowing when to get out, um, I'm going to blend this into the other topic uh, because I think it's really important to know a lot about yourself and to know why you're feeling like you need to make a big change or get out. And I don't know which workshops you signed up for, but if you're going to come with me later today, we're going to talk about an exercise to do that. Because sometimes you think that you need to really just get out of a field, get out of a situation. But there's actually just one component that is dragging you down. It's dragging your engagement and your energy down. And you can often make changes that dramatically um, change your outlook on things and still stay exactly where you're at. So knowing uh, a lot about yourself is important. And so going to the next topic, I think that's something that I wish I would have done more of when I was a graduate student, when I was a postdoc is really understanding who I was, what I was interested in, um, what excited me, and then use that to plan. And you don't get many opportunities to do that when you're you know, a graduate student or a postdoc. And so you really need to seek them out. Um, one thing that I did while I was here is at, on the Cornell campus, there's the, uh, the postdoc office, and they run a leadership program. And I managed to get into that leadership program. And they do things like the Myers-Briggs testing, which people do that and they don't really pay attention to it. It tells you a lot. It tells you a lot about where you get your energy from, um, what excites you. And I didn't pay enough attention to it then, but I've sub subsequently done similar things. It wasn't until probably this year that I realized I'm a people person. So I spent 39 years thinking I disliked people. I didn't want to be around a lot of people. So how does that happen? 
that is my father. He truly is not a people person. And I'm like him in a lot of ways. And I just assumed I was like him in that way. And I kind of went through everything I did not being with people. And sometimes not liking what I was doing along that path. And uh, recently, there's been this merger. There's relocations out of our department. And it's become where I've, I've gone from being around people, being engaged with people all day long, to now I'm kind of one of the last people left in this area. And I'm by myself. And I started to get really demotivated. And I only realized it was none of the work had changed. It was because I was now in an environment where I wasn't with people. I wasn't uh, interacting with a lot of people. Now, it should not take 39 years <laughs> to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. <laughs> uh, so we are, it's uh, almost 12. Um, I don't know if you might have seen this slide before. It's for, for like where our, which workshops and when. And um, I hope this is clear enough. Um, but also I sent out an email beforehand and the we have lists, right? Um, but um, I want to have one round of famous last words, um, maybe some <laughs> little take home message, uh, like really not more than a minute. We start with Jesse. Uh, I think I, I would hate to have to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll just say my last, my last comment was pretty good. Good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Just it's, Welcome to it's time community. well spent to really spend time on yourself and to spend time uh, understanding yourself and, and where you want to go. So I'll leave it at that. This is really difficult. I don't, I don't know if there are famous last words. I, I think that finding yourself is definitely important and something that I'm continuing to do and I don't think I will ever stop doing. Um, but I think in doing that, you find the things that you like doing and you try to find more of that. Um, and there's always going to be difficult parts and it's minimizing those and knowing that they're not going to be forever. Um, my PhD, I liken it to one long dental appointment. But um, <laughs> it's fun. I'm glad I did it. Are there times when I have imposter syndrome? Of course. But it, you know, it, it's, it's something that during the process there were parts that were fun and there were parts that were awful. So it's just continuing, I think. <laughs> One long dental appointment. I love that. Um, do I have any closing words of sage advice? Um, I guess not really, other than just following your heart. And that sounds corny. And it sounds like it shouldn't lead anywhere, but it does. It leads to where you want to be. And I think don't worry about the money. Don't worry about that. As long as you get happiness in the United States is directly correlated with uh, money up until about $20,000 US a year, according to UN studies. And beyond 20,000 US, which I take to be kind of the basal living, you have a, a meal and a, a roof over your head, it doesn't correlate. So go for things that are interesting. I did want to say one thing about immigration that I, I didn't answer. I'm actually an Irish citizen as well. So I have like the best of all worlds because I have an EU, and American citizenship. Um, but in my department, I have three Canadians working. And something you might not know about immigration sometimes that can make your life easier, in particular between Canada and the US, is there's a right to work in both countries that's automatic as part of the NAFTA agreement. So I had people in my department that existed on one year NAFTA visas every year. Cornell hired them and was working through the process of getting them a green card. But for four, five, six years, they drove to the border of Buffalo and requested an automatic one-year NAFTA visa to work in the United States. And that has to be granted under the treaty, right? as long as that treaty remains in. So there might be a treaty that covers your two countries. None of my three colleagues knew that. Cornell's legal department knew that. 
we have some interesting tax rules concerning the European citizens who for two years don't have to pay taxes, which is also very nice. <laughs> 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 I enjoy it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry to do it. So I don't have any famous words, but I just want to comment a little bit about Andrea's question and then Annie's question. So, um, Seems like I'm the only non US citizen on the panel, but unfortunately, I'm only a grad student. Uh, there's definitely a lot of difficulties in this uh, because I, I have been looking for an intern for a long time, and then in fact, the, all the alumni from our group are kind of helping me in different ways. Still, it's pretty hard. But uh, uh, I do recommend you check the check it online very carefully to see what's the re what are the requirements you need to apply the green card later in your life stage. Don't wait until you have a lot of answers to Annie's question. I wish I did, did this a long time ago. So that's the suggestion I have. But there's definitely possibilities. For example, one of the students from my group, Inish, he actually got into Pfizer right after grad school without doing a postdoc. And then the way he did this is he asked one of the chemistry professors, which is her name, and then he, re he introduced the Inish to one of the uh, very, um, I think it's a very important person in Jensen. And then she used to, she has a lot of connections to Pfizer, and that's how he got the job. So still, networking is very important, and you need to keep trying to talk to people. You, do, you don't know who will eventually help you. Maybe you talk to 100 people, only one person can actually offer you a job, but it all worth it, because all the connections, it's not one time, it's lifelong connection, I think. Yeah, I'll just say that I, unfortunately I don't have too many life stories to share with you, but um, yeah. And then finally, as the organizer, I'm so happy to see so many of you today, and then I hope you enjoy it so far. I also do not have any super smart things to say, but um, as I'm trying to finish up my PhD, uh, trying to finish up, um, I do a lot of things on campus as part of different um, groups, and like, I'm really excited to help plan things and plan some things at BTI on campus, so I'm really happy to say yes. But as I'm trying to focus on my PhD and focus on finishing, focus on myself, I think it's also important to say no. So I just have one little thing to say. Um, so two years ago, we, um, Katie, we had kind of the idea to, to create like a job board online. Uh, BTI alumni connection network tool and there was like a guy called Mark Stowers um, he was like yeah, I have hundreds of jobs and uh, internships around the, the globe which is very promising and, and I would still contact him and also I would ask from now on every, every, all of our visitors or people who are involved if you have job opportunities or for internships let us know we will work on sort of setting up the infrastructure um, to, to make it happen. And if, if you say you have uh, something available, we want to know that. And uh, this would be a very direct kind of benefit from BTI alumni interactions. I also, as a co-organizer, I want to thank you so much for being here. And it's not over, so we have these workshops. Uh, I hope this is relatively clear to everybody. Uh, also, after, like, before we start at 1.30, some people will guide you to 2.17 and where's 4, 4.15, which is on the fourth floor. And, and now I think lunch is there, is it, is it all set up? And uh, otherwise we still have a lot of cake. <laughs> and, um, thank you everybody, that was a pleasure. And um, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs>